Welcome to First Mover, your first global look at today's action in the Bitcoin blockchain and digital asset space. I'm your host, Christine Lee, and joining me are my co-hosts, Coinest Managing Editor of Global Capital Markets, Lawrence Lewitton, and Managing Director of International Content, Emily Parker. Good morning. You two are back in the spaceship. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, welcome back. Jeff Bezos is heading to space. Bitcoin is coming back to Earth, though, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Checking Ground in control on- to major. Checking in on Bitcoin, the coin is Bitcoin price. XBX index is currently trading at $29,716. It's below that psychological $30,000 support line. And the Coindesk Ether price ETX index right now is at $17.57. And the new DFX, Coindesk's DeFi index, is trading at $388. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as a leader in crypto news events and data. So yeah, the top story today is that Bitcoin is below that $30,000 mark, Lawrence. So the markets, what's going on? Yeah, the, basically, people aren't aren't that crazy bullish right now. We're seeing in the in the CME futures are in backwardation, which is a pretty bearish sign. It means that there's there isn't as much demand for or expect, expected demand for future Bitcoin uh, in the coming months. So the, basically, what we're seeing is a continuation of low volume, low uh, lower and lower highs, and and lower and lower lows. Um, it, you know, this is. This is this is a letdown. It's a it's a slow letdown. Breaking below that thirty thousand mark was was important because there was a lot of buy orders there, and it just it went right through them. So I think twenty seven is the next uh, target, according to Dominic Dantes, who's our uh, our in house CMT. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll see what happens next. Mm-hmm. But uh, this isn't this isn't looking uh, so optimistic, at least for the time being. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the fud, everyone. Emily, from a macro perspective, uh, how do you see things going forward? Yeah, I don't think the larger macro narrative of Bitcoin has really changed. Um, You know, last week, Coindesk reported that Bank of America was allowing for, you know, uh, Bitcoin futures trading for some of its clients. This is the larger narrative about Bitcoin is institutions getting involved. So if you just have a little bit of patience, I I think that, um, you know, we could see this larger narrative coming back. All right. Well, Joining us is now to discuss the crypto markets is uh, the co-founder of the large stablecoin by market cap, Tether, and co-founder of NFT marketplace, Wax. Welcome to the show, uh, William. So we're seeing Bitcoin below $30,000. What do you see is the reason behind this? Is it just the summer doldrums? Well, um, everyone has an explanation, right? And anytime you try to provide a narrative, there's, uh, there's, it's a guess. But there are a ton of them to do. Clearly, Chinese, um, after China cracked down on miners, uh, spooked a lot of Chinese buyers. I think, you know, we can never forget how important the China market is to crypto and in particular Bitcoin. You also had, you know, at the beginning of this year, Remember, we're right where we were in basically January of of this year, about 29,000 and change. And that was a 200% increase from Q4. So we basically surrendered all the gains in 2021. However, you know, you had a lot of of momentum right around that time. You had you had, you know, Square announcing how much they were doing, uh, MicroStrategy buying a lot of crypto by issuing bonds, then PayPal announcing that it was going to start to allow people to buy crypto. And then we thought from early Q4, uh, a lot of Wall Street um, titans were starting to say maybe Bitcoin and crypto overall is a good place to put some percentage of your portfolio. And I think uh, for various reasons, there's been a pause. Of course, the last major factor was there was great fears of inflation in in January, February, March, as there was worries that the United States' new administration was going to flood the market with a lot of stimulus, liquidity. And I think inflation fears, while still existing, I think are subdued now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've just got a lot of assumptions that, turned out not to be as um, as significant. And so there's been a pullback, like the 500th pullback in, in, yes, in Bitcoin. in crypto. You know, uh, but also another 
Just switching topics, another big topic is stable coins. And we have a lot of central bankers mm -hmm. saying that uh, with stable coins, they link them to an era of free banking in the United States, which uh, pre-Civil War era, which was a uh, failure. And as the co-founder of Tether, the largest stable coin, I, I wonder how you, uh, bel what your thoughts are on this whole narrative. Well, first I'll say, uh it might take five years, it might take 10 years, uh, but every fiat currency globally of any significant economy will be tokenized. And the simple reason is, is there's no downside to tokenizing your fiat. There are only pluses. Rarely do you have that where a change has only benefits. So the tokenization of, of fiat will happen. Uh, of course, uh, many countries are worried about non-sovereign issued uh currency and that's what that's what these stable coins are but i think we don't know how quickly the um, uh, sovereign governments are going to tokenize their cash and there's a lot of people in crypto who need a safe harbor a place to get in and out quickly of risk that's the appeal of of stable coins and that's not going to go away traders need it you can't arbitrage if one of the two pairs you're trading is not stable. So there's a bunch of reasons why stable coins are here to stay. There's many, many stable coins now. And of course, DeFi, uh, one of the two or three key ingredients to DeFi is a stable coin. What we don't know today is how permissive the, the um, sovereigns are gonna be in allowing people to trade these currencies. In China, I assume, um, it's you're going to have to be a, a Chinese citizen in order to trade the uh, the digital RMB. So there'll always probably be a need for uh, a non-sovereign issued stablecoin. So you know, I think you're right. Stablecoins are here to stay, but there's sort of two separate things. There's the government-backed digital currencies, and there's the private stablecoins. So what we know is that the private stablecoin market is now big enough. You know, the three top stablecoin issuers are at something like 100 billion in market cap. So this is like firmly on regulators' radar, right? They are going to be paying attention to this. So I think it's if stablecoins are here to stay, stablecoin regulation is probably here to stay. So what would state? What might stablecoin regulation even look like? Like you know, there's a bunch of ideas being tossed around. What do you think will happen? Because they're probably going to do something. It's, it's clear. Anytime you get into the money services business, uh, you have two things that are dominant. It's AML, any money laundering, and KYC, know your customer. So those are the two principal ways the governments of the world track who owns what. And so AML and KYC will become more and more and more important. Uh, what is harder to figure out, of course, is with decentralized, really decentralized uh, stable coins, I'm talking about algorithmic stable coins, which are not linked to a fiat currency directly, they're just indexed to a currency. What we don't know is how those will be uh, regulated or managed because they are decentralized. You know, often they're issued by DAOs. So, um, I think maybe governments won't like them, but I'm not sure there's much they can do about it because, you know, decentralized finance is is a big factor and and they like uh, algorithmic stable coins. Bill, uh, getting back to that discussion about KYC and AML, um, you know, this is something that's been brought up about the early days of Tether and, and its current problems now. And that is Tether never got a money transmitter license in any of the U.S. states. Um, it was based in, in BVI in the British Virgin Islands, um, whereas you had Kraken and Coinbase having these these licenses, and and that also put them within a regulatory framework uh, that allows them to to operate in the United States without any problems. How were you able at, in Tether's early days to take in funds without a, without that kind of a license in the United States? Well, um, everything in the early days of crypto was uncertain. You know, whether or not these these uh, things were even considered money, consider that to the uh, IRS, uh, uh, crypto was property to the Treasury Department. It was money to the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. They were commodities. So uh, the federal government, the U.S. federal government has never had a unified approach, uh, a framework for thinking about cryptos, broadly speaking, or stable coins. 
So, you know, in the absence of, of clear guidance, we, you know, we made guesses as to what was uh, the appropriate way to go forward. And so far, I think it's borne out to be the right path. Uh, the dominant stablecoin today globally is st- by a, f- a factor of probably 10 is still Tether. So uh, you- clearly uh, the investors of the world still like it. And uh, anytime a regulatory regime changes, you know, things you adapt. I remember in the early days of PayPal, I was the first institutional investor. Uh, we did not know about money service business licenses. You know, it was something new. We had to be be told. So um, I, I don't think it's a, you know, what happened in the past happened in the past. And going forward, I think stablecoin issuers will need to comply with these global regimes. That's what I expect to happen with Tether and, and all the others, other than, as I mentioned, the decentralized tokens, the uh, the algorithmic ones, because there is not a central body controlling those. Do you, do you think that Tether is issuing uh, USDT in exchange for other currencies or, or assets outside the United States or reinvesting uh, foreign currencies into, let's say, commercial paper um, that, that's not dollar denominated? Yeah. Is, is that effectively I, printing money? By doing that. Yeah, I, I, uh, of course, I'm no longer associated with Tether. So I, that right. would be a question you have to pose to the Tether people. I don't know, you know, how they are uh, doing things today. Although clearly there are, there are stable coins you can get into today that are indexed to different currencies as they should be, not just to the US dollar. Of course, Libra, Facebook's attempt at a stable coin was going to do just that. It was going to be indexed to a basket of currencies because they're a global company with a global uh, pool of of customers. So uh, I do think you'll see more of those sorts of things, an index to a composite of many, many different currencies. Um, as I said, stable coins are going to be here for a long, long time. They're just a more efficient way to pay for things, to move money cross-border. And, um, you know, Tether's one, but there are others. So you mentioned that USDT by far holds the dominant stablecoin position, but that's actually, there's now some challengers, right? And, and one of the biggest challengers is USDC. Um, do you, can you imagine a future in which USDC overcap, overtakes Tether? Of course. I mean, I've been in the technology space for a long time. There was a time when no one could imagine Yahoo would be trumped by Google. So yeah, of course, there. Uh, uh, it, it all depends on how these these businesses evolve going forward. Uh, there are some people who prefer USDC. Overwhelmingly today, they prefer Tether. And the reason is because Tether has an enormous lead in trading pairs. Uh, half of all Bitcoin globally is traded against Tether. And on virtually any of the thousands of exchanges globally, there are many, many Tether trading pairs. That'll That'll change over time. You will see more people uh, wanting different types of, of stable coins, maybe the algorithmic ones. Um, I don't really see it as competition uh, because they could do different things. Uh, USDC is controlled by Circle and, and, and Coinbase, and there may be US-centric thinking that goes into USDC that maybe isn't as important in Asia or South America or Africa. So, you know... Uh, I think there's plenty of room for multiple stablecoins. All right, Willem, we've got to leave it there, but thank you for weighing in on stablecoins, Tether, and more. You're welcome. Thank you. That was Tether and Wax co-founder William Quigley coming up, checking in on Asia and a crypto markets update focused on Thailand. Now for the daily forecast, an update on what's happening in the Asia crypto markets. Here's Angie Lau of Forecast News. 
Welcome to the Daily Forecast, July 20th, 2021. I'm Angie Lau, Editor-in-Chief of Forecast News, covering all things blockchain. Coming up, U.S. Senators urge ban on use of the digital yuan at Beijing Olympics. Russia woos crypto miners with green credentials. And street performers embrace accepting digital payments. Let's get you up to speed from Asia to the world. A trio of U.S. Senators are pushing back against the potential use of ECNY by American athletes at the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics. Now, China is expected to launch the digital yuan at the Games. And now in a letter, Senators Marsha Blackburn, Roger Wicker and Cynthia Loomis are all urging the U.S. Olympic Committee to forbid American athletes from receiving or using the digital currency. The letter raises concerns over privacy, stating that Olympic athletes should be aware that the digital yuan may be used to surveil Chinese citizens and those visiting China on an unprecedented scale. But one expert told Forecast News that athletes may struggle to get by without the digital currency. Within the Olympic Village, uh, that shouldn't be a problem. But as soon as you step out of the Olympic Village, uh, you know, not having access to digital currencies may potentially be a challenge. And yes, while there's numerous apps uh, that people can download, you know, from uh, Tencent Pay, Alipay, to have over 90% of the market share, the reality is if you don't have a Chinese bank account, you cannot use those for payments. So as a foreigner, you're pretty much unbanked in China. China has already made huge leaps towards becoming a cashless society, with almost 90% of smartphone users having made proximity mobile transaction payments in the last year. And Arcelanian says the domestic economy economy in China is what is actually driving the development of the digital currency. Meanwhile, over in Russia, Russia is looking to woo green crypto miners. The Russian Association of Crypto Industry and Blockchain, or RASIB, has announced a project to encourage crypto miners to move to Russia. RASIB says it has formed working groups with authorities and state-owned enterprises that will look to entice mining firms to the country. And that includes boosting the country's green credentials by constructing eco-mining farms powered by renewable sources. Russia has already started building wind farms, providing almost 1,200 megawatts of electricity this year, with more to come. The association says it's already working with a consortium of Chinese mining companies, which control together more than 25 percent of the global hash rate for Bitcoin. And on to the markets now. Investors during the Asian trading hours were bearish on Bitcoin, down almost 6 percent at just under the 30,000 U.S. dollar mark. That's as of 4 p.m. local Hong Kong time today. And in the top 10 for cryptocurrencies, Polkadot down 13 percent and Binance Coin down 11 percent. The global crypto market cap shrinking close to 7 percent from the same time the day before. And finally today, could crypto be key to the survival of the world's buskers? You heard right. Melbourne's RMIT University researchers found street performers in Australia who embraced taking digital payments during the pandemic, which drove people, of course, away from carrying cash, often received a lot more money. Data was gathered from 3,500 performers who are all members of the online platform The Busking Project. The study's author told us there's been an explosion in digital payments, with the amount of donations received this way jumping 44x since the beginning of the pandemic. Not only has the number of digital payments increased, but the average donation also rose to 20 Australian dollars or almost 15 US dollars. And street circus performers have have reported the greatest success as they interact with the crowd the most. They incorporate it into what they call their hat line. So, you know, if you if you give me $10, you know, I'll, I'll give you a photo. If you give me $20, um, you can take me out for dinner. And, you know, they can put these elements into their into their chat. Elkin says broadening a street performer's options to include digital payments has actually provided a natural next step for these creative entrepreneurs. Well, I think it might be time to learn how to juggle. And that's the daily forecast from our vantage point right here in Asia. For more, visit forecast.news. I'm Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Until the next time. The Crypto Markets Update is presented by Grayscale, the world's largest digital currency asset manager.
Let's have a live look at Bitcoin. The coin is Bitcoin price XVX index currently at below 30,000. It's at 29,759. Bitcoin's down about 3.5% over the past 24 hours. And the Coindesk Ether price ETX index is at 1753. ETH is down about 3.7%. And the new DFX Coindesk's DeFi index is at 388. DeFi also taking a hit. It's down almost 7% over the past 24 hours. Meanwhile, the venture arm of Siem Commercial Bank, Thailand's oldest bank, saying decentralized finance will disrupt traditional finance, and they're preparing for the day it upends the banking industry. Joining us now to discuss is Mukaya Thai Panich, Chief Venture and Investment Officer at SCB10X. Welcome to the show, Thai. So would love to get your take as we see Bitcoin take this plunge below 30,000. What, what's going on in the crypto markets? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, for us, um, you know, whether Bitcoin price going up or down, we actually a long term investor. And for us, we actually view decentralized finance is having something very, very similar to traditional finance, but can be much more efficient. Um, actually, last year, when we were looking for different type of emerging technologies that could disrupt the bank and financial institution industry in general, we actually come across um, decentralized finance while we were looking at blockchain. And, um, you know, I actually have been investing in technology sector for 16 years. Uh, before this, I was in, um, yeah. in investment management. Ty, so and I'm wondering, why yeah. and when do you see DeFi taking over traditional finance? Um, actually, I don't think that uh, it will take over traditional finance, but I think that's a way to work together because um, I don't think that, that everybody would like to take care of their money themselves. And some of the people definitely would still want to, um, you know, have uh, uh, the call center that they can call in and complain or ask questions, which you can actually not do that in um, with DeFi. So I feel that uh, there should be potential for traditional finance and DeFi to work together. Um, traditional finance, we're very good at uh, acquiring customer and be the front end. Our um, interface is very easy to use. So we could continue to be the front end acquiring customer and interact with customer, but we could integrate with DeFi and DeFi could be the software um, running the back end for decentralized finance and could reduce the number of uh, people uh, no need to have human involved so much. Yeah, so I feel that uh, we could actually work together and I don't mm -hmm. think that traditional finance will completely go away. You say work together, but but maybe you can go into explaining the state of crypto in Thailand because China, uh, rather mm -hmm. Thailand is banning meme coins and NFTs as part of a crypto crackdown. Thai regulators are also filing criminal complaints against uh, crypto exchange Binance. Yeah, um, I think in general, Thai regulators are quite friendly with uh, crypto and DeFi compared to other countries like China and India. But uh, for example, meme coin, uh, social token, fan tokens, those are really not, uh, you know, the digital asset that actually have the uh, meaningful asset back. And the government are afraid of um, the speculation angle and therefore they control that. And then for the DeFi part, um, as long as the DeFi projects actually do not solicit the Thai customer directly with Thai language advertisement, they are still okay with uh, those DeFi company. But as long as um, the moment that uh, this DeFi company would like to solicit Thai people, they would want the DeFi companies to come and ask for the permission um, and they might look to control if that is the case. Yeah, in, in terms of Binance too, because um, Binance is actually solicit the Thai customer um, in Thai language with the Thai advertisement, and they do not have the license um, to operate their license, uh, their exchange in Thailand, so that, that is not allowed. So I actually find this kind of fascinating, this idea of banning meme coins. I don't think I've ever heard of this before from any other mm -hmm. government. So this is kind of a very innovative <laughs> government regulation. So just a couple mm -hmm. questions about that that I think our global audience would be interested in. First of all, how does the government define or the authorities define what a meme coin is, right? That's like a hard thing to define. And then what does banning meme coins actually mean? If you could just explain that policy, because it's I've, I've really never heard of anything like that before. 
Yeah, I think in general, um, the government do not like um, you know, the tokens that do not really have the utility. Um, for example, if it's like a meme coin, it doesn't really have um any meaning associated with it or, or fan token. Yeah, like those, for example. So um, the government do not like the speculativeness of um, you know, this type of uh digital asset. So that's why they would like to um regulate on this. So the government just decides which which coins have utility and which don't. Yeah, they they actually look at uh, the asset that is um back behind and the utility that uh, they're supposed to do. Uh, Ty, you, your firm I believe invested fifty million dollars in DeFi. How did it allocate it? What, mm-hmm. what kind of projects was was it putting it into? Actually, um, that fifty million dollar is not just for DeFi, but it's for blockchain. And digital asset as well. Huh. And since then, the allocation has also been increased to 110 million dollars. Um, in general, when we invest in DeFi, there are two things that we look at. So first thing, we would like to invest in the project that are uh, um, quite parallel to traditional finance. Uh, we have already invested in Alpha Finance Lab, which is credit lending protocol with leverage. And and of course, we all know that credit lending that is the bread and butter of the bank. And also another project that we invested in is Anchor Protocol, which is um, uh, credit lending, but uh, with fixed interest rate. And that is uh, interrupt, sorry, that disrupting fixed income. And that is a very, very big market as well in traditional finance. And then the second thing that we look at is more on the infrastructure for DeFi. So for us, we recently invested in a cross-chain interoperability DeFi protocol because we feel that the future of DeFi is actually cross-chain. Um, right now, each blockchain actually do most of um, the communication, the work within each blockchain, like Ethereum, for example, the most popular blockchain. Um, there's so many DeFi protocols in there, but um, the asset and information do not really travel across to um, other blockchain that much, like, for example, um, there's still only um, very few projects that cross over to Solana or to um, Polkadot, things like that. Yeah. So we feel that in the future, there should be a lot more communication. Mm-hmm. Um, there should be information and asset that, yeah. that transfer across to different blockchain Ty, to increase it's, efficiency. It's very, mm-hmm. uh, very fascinating to see your firm have a foot forward on the developments in DeFi and the blockchain space. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, thank you very much for having me. That was SCB 10X Chief Venture and Investment Officer Mikhaya Tai Panich. Coming up, a social media network where you can earn crypto and the latest out of Janet Yellen's meeting on stable coins with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day. Coindesk indexes, the market standard for crypto assets since 2014. Our trusted data powers billions in publicly traded funds. Coindesk indexes are the standard used by institutions, and they're the key for investors looking to understand and access crypto markets. As the company that launched the world's first ever Bitcoin ETF, we at Purpose chose the Coindesk Bitcoin Price Index, the XBX, to price our assets. Coindesk indexes enabled the early adopters to build crypto investment vehicles, and they're already trusted by a new generation of global investors. Welcome back. Checking in with Coindesk Global Policy and Regulation Managing Editor Nick Day, who is also the editor of Coindesk's The State of Crypto newsletter. Hey there, Nick. So Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen had a meeting, I believe it wasn't open to the public yesterday, about stable coins. Do we have any insights onto what may have happened? Yeah, the Treasury Department published a press release last night, you know, basically confirming that the meeting happened and revealing that, you know, in addition to the heads of the SEC, CFTC, Federal Reserve and Treasury Department, uh, you know, members, uh, they had participants from the FDIC. So FDIC Chair Yelena McWilliams, uh, they had, you know, Fed Vice Chair uh, Randall Pearls, um, they had Acting Controller Michael Sue. So it was a wider group than, you know, we initially thought. But for the most part, the release didn't really add a lot to, you know, what they originally announced on Friday. You know, the big thing still, uh, still seems to be that, you know, they will publish recommendations for how to regulate stable coins. And, you know, it remains to be seen just what that will look like, whether that's going to be focused on, you know, congressional action or rulemaking from the agencies themselves. But, you know, either way, the, the big focus seems to be that, you know, this is coming. This is going to happen, uh, you know, presumably within, you know, by the end of 2021 even maybe. 
Nick, if you had to guess what's the low-hanging fruit, like what kind of stablecoin regulation are we likely to see first? So there's been a lot of talk about that Fed paper. Um, I think we were discussing it yesterday, but you know, this idea of regulating stablecoin issuers like banks, you know, that's not even a new idea. We've actually seen that before. Like last year, uh, a couple of representatives published a or introduced a bill called the Stable Act, which basically, you know, had the same requirements. Basically, making uh, stablecoin issuers, you know, secure FDIC insurance and abide by certain bank regulations to, you know, ensure consumer safety. Um, so that seems to be one of the big ideas that, you know. Maybe we're seeing a little bit more discussion of right now. So, Nick, uh, speaking of stable coins, USDC and Mastercard have a, some sort of deal going on right now that that's been announced. Uh, give us a little more color on that. Yeah, so it looks like Mastercard is working with uh, USDC Circle as well as Paxos and Evolve Trust and ba- uh, Bank and Trust to basically try and you know help merchants accept crypto and looks like USDC will kind of be this intermediary where, you know, a consumer can buy some or pay for something using their crypto. Um, merchant uh, cannot settle on MasterCard's network, uh, you know, using crypto. So Circle will convert to fiat. Um, they'll settle it in USDC. And then MasterCard will handle the fiat side of the transaction, basically letting cardholders pay with crypto, essentially. Or that's the same with Paxos, right? All right, Nick, thanks for the update. That was Coindesk Managing Editor of Global Policy and Regulation, Nick Day. Don't forget to sign up for the State of Crypto newsletter on Coindesk.com. The Coindesk Spotlight is brought to you by Nexo, the place to earn on Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more. Think about all that time you spend on social media. What if you could earn and be rewarded for all those hours you spent posting about your last vacation? Crypto social network Minds gamifies social media and rewards users with the Ethereum minted Minds token. Joining us now to discuss is CEO and founder of Minds, Bill Ottman. Welcome to the show, Bill. So first off, Perhaps you can explain to us how Minds works. I had a chance to sign up and I took a look at it. It kind of reminded me of Facebook. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Minds is an open source decentralized social network. And, you know, we just think that censorship resistance, decentralized infrastructure, rewards for creators, monetization, privacy, end-to-end encryption, sort of doing everything the opposite way that big tech is doing it. Um, you know, that that's where we need to go. And so, you know, we we support Bitcoin and and fiat as well and for rewards for creators, but also Ethereum and and uh, and our token. So it's creating incentive mechanisms for users to contribute, uh, develop code. Is it's all about incentives and rewarding users, putting users first. Bill, you just did a round of fundraising. Fundraising. Uh, what was the valuation on that? Seventy post. And uh, where is your geographic base located? Like, like, where where are your users? So you have something like what's it? Fourteen million users. Where where are most of those people? Yeah, so we've got people. We had like half a million million users joined from Thailand in response to some crackdowns from their government and somewhat of a revolving door with Twitter. We've seen similar waves from from Vietnam, but our, our the core of our user base in the U.S., U.K., Canada, Australia. So I totally like the spirit of this, but you know, one of the big challenges for upstart social media platforms is just getting that network effect, right? That can compete with Facebook or Twitter. I mean, do you think like just over the long term, what's going to get more and more people or more mainstream people to leave these platforms where they already have a network and they're already comfortable to try something new? Absolutely. I think it's all about incentives, um, but we make it harder for ourselves to grow almost intentionally because we're not willing to spy on everybody in order to sort of create network effects in a dirty way. So, you know, it's it's a long, slow, sustainable cr- climb. Um, I think that, you know, at the, end, at the end of the day, though, people, while totally addicted to Twitter, Facebook, Google, um, you know, are bitter about how they're treating them. And so, you know, ultimately, in sort of the, the, the steady growth of, of crypto in general, I think that crypto will eat social media. It's 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 gonna eat every industry. So, Bill, uh, copyright protection is a big issue for a lot of social media now. 
Uh, YouTube uh, also has issues with it. What are you guys doing to protect content creators who have their stuff pirated on on your uh, censorship resistant uh, site? Sure. So we're hybrid infrastructure in that users have the option to post to in, in, immutable systems. So, you know, they can delete by default. You actually have to, sp when you post, you have to specifically decide to post to uh, the perma web. So we have an integration with Arweave, which is a decentralized content storage system, but that's optional. And we make it very clear to people that, you know, you better know what you're getting into with, with immutable content. But if, they, if someone posts a video, if someone posts a video that's that's copyright, and and they it's immutable, how do you get it off the the system well, are we, when their lawyers well, call you? Sure. So Arweave has a system where their nodes can essentially choose to ignore and forget about various content that gets reported. But um, so yeah, that I mean. There are definitely copyright issues when it comes to blockchains. We've uh, we've been able to navigate it because you know we also do have central servers that where, where we can delete content from. But I mean, just look at the NFT space. It's it's like sort of like a it's copyright chaos, and um, it's it's something that we have to deal with as as we move into this new space. So are you saying with this network, we wouldn't see what happened to say? Uh, President Trump, when he, former President Trump, when the Capitol riots happened and Twitter basically shut down his Twitter account later on, that wouldn't happen on this network. It would be immutable, decentralized. And I am also curious, how do users earn exactly? Are users giving each other money for, for the engagement, for the posts that they write, or is the network, does it have a fund and then it rewards users that way? Sure. So, yeah, on the, on the censorship stuff, um, we have a First Amendment-based content policy, which is a major differentiator from most big tech networks. No one really knows what their policy is. They seem to sort of randomly make decisions, and it's sort of a mess. And, you know, we saw recently, uh, just this week, that the Biden administration is apparently talking behind the scenes with uh, major social networks on what content to take down and what they deem misinformation. Obviously, misinformation is a huge problem and we have to deal with it, but there are probably more intelligent ways through different consensus mechanisms and decentralized trust and reputation that could solve this. So, um, and then in terms of the reward system, so yeah, we, uh, all of our tokens are, we have 10,000 that are emitted daily in three buckets, engagement rewards, holding rewards, and liquidity rewards. And so users can earn through you know, posting uh, and contributing popular content or just holding or providing liquidity into Uniswap. So we have a, a direct uh, integration with, with Uniswap. Bill, how, how many employees do you have right now? About 15. So, okay. A lot of work. But, but, but put it this way. So, you know, scaling uh, in the open source world in terms of contributors is, is easier than in the proprietary world. And, you know, look, I mean, Instagram only had uh, a dozen employees when, when Facebook bought them. Obviously, we will never sell to Facebook. But you can scale a social network with a relatively small team and, you know, the power of the open source community. Fantastic. Well, Bill, I think it's super fascinating and uh, looking forward to see how your social network grows. Thanks for having me. All right. That was Mind CEO Bill Ottman. Time now to check in with crypto Twitter with our tweet of the day. And the bears are back in town. Dr. Doom and Gloom, Nero Rabini, economist and former advisor to the Clinton administration, not skipping a beat. Bitcoin price is now below 30,000, he writes. A critical level, meaning the majority of retail suckers who entered into the market after March 2021 are in the red. Fundamentally, it should go much lower. Only issue will tether pump and pump and dump schemes now prop it up as in past episodes. Definitely not skipping a beat there with our bears. All right, that's it for First Mover. Thank you, Emily Parker and Lawrence Lewton. I'm your host, Christine Lee. I'll be back live at 3 p.m. with All About Bitcoin. Coming up at noon is The Hash. You're watching Coindesk TV.